how do you embrace the volatility with a guy like DJ Moore? Because it hasn't been something where it's just Justin Fields in, Justin Fields out. It's been week one through three, wide receiver 40. Week four through five, wide receiver one. Week six through 10, wide receiver 33. It's it's a heck of a peak and valley here. Even Let's with feel like some Justin pretty Fields. arbitrary splits there, Alfredo. I- Round one, fight. I just want to say, I feel like you're just kind of drawing lines. No, you feel like how is it arbitrary? Take, take how is it arbitrary to say that? Game, how, taking a game where Justin Fields no, played half a game. Come on, feels come pretty on, arbitrary man. to me. What's arbitrary? Looking at DJ Moore have two massive blow up games. And then the rest of the game's not good? Come on, that's not arbitrary. He had more than four games with Justin Fields where he wasn't in the top 24 than he did with me. I don't think it's fair just because he's like, he'll be great. What do you think he has two? I'm just going to be a little bit more. So let's put you and me aside. A month ago, we ranked the top 30 wide receivers and with the fantasy playoffs looming, you know what? We're going to adjust the ranks. And we've got 31 wide receivers this time. We did so much better, guys. Look at us. Yeah, this is great. I really like this exercise because it it gives us an idea of trade values, who to buy, who to sell, kind of where we see these wide receivers for the rest of the season, the strength of schedule. And so uh, Dave Kluge and I are joined by the phenomenal Joey Wright. Excuse me, how it is written in the show sheet. Handsome Joey Wright. Mm-hmm. I wish I wish you would get that hat out of your face though. That way we could see your handsomeness. I feel I like a mom. I was allowed to wear it when they, when they tell you. No. Oh, you, oh, you're hundred percent allowed to. It's just you know what shows off your handsomeness the most. Uh, okay. I appreciate this exercise. It's the only exercising I've done this month, so I, I do appreciate you giving me this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm allowed to say right, that so about myself. Gonna... So. Yeah, yeah. Self-deprecating humor is always welcome on this show. So what we're going to do is we're going to hop into the tiers that we have for these wide receivers. In tier five, we're going to start with wide receivers 31 through 26. These are the wide receivers that just missed the cut. So I'm going to list these guys off to you. At 31, we've got DeAndre Hopkins, 30, Jordan Addison, 29, Zay Flowers, 28, DK Metcalf, 27, Terry McLaurin, and at 26, Nico Collins. Now, I, before we I even ask which player from this group is likely to outperform their ranking currently, we talked about this before the show. After last night's performance, guys, are we missing on Cortland Sutton here? Should he maybe be in consideration to be a top 30 wide receiver, or is he just outside of that? Yeah, if he can keep scoring touchdowns every single week, you know, he's going to be a serviceable wide receiver three. But outside of the touchdown scoring, there hasn't really been too much to get excited about. And I mean, yesterday was a frustrating game too. Like Corlin Sutton had that one catch that was just beyond improbable, probably the catch of the year. And then outside of that had drops. I mean, he had the one catch that they called a catch and said that he was down by contact that I don't know if it was really a catch. He had another one where he fumbled when he was pushing for the first down. I think Corlin Sutton's a really good player. I like Corlin Sutton a lot. I think the issue with Corlin Sutton though, more than anything is Russell Wilson. I mean, you look at this offense, Russell Wilson is afraid to take shots downfield, and that's what he made a living off of in Seattle, and now he is just kind of a game manager. You see him looking deep downfield, and if he doesn't immediately have a guy open, he just checks down to the line of scrimmage, and that's what you see is a lot of check downs, yards after the catch. Russ, I think, is kind of inhibiting the entire offense right now, keeping Jerry Judy from being fantasy relevant whatsoever, and Corlin Sutton, the Points have been there, but it has been extremely underwhelming. Uh, I'd have to check, but I don't think he's eclipsed 20 points in a single fantasy game this season. He's just like getting a 10 to 20 every single week. No ceiling, relatively high floor. Makes for a decent kind of plug in during the bye weeks, but not a guy that I really want to put inside my top 30. Joey, out of these wide receivers that we have listed here, which one do you think is most likely to outperform their current ranking between Nico Collins, Terry McLaurin, DK Metcalf, say Flowers, Jordan Addison, DeAndre Hopkins. When I look at this list, like for me, the true wide receiver one on here is Zay Flowers. He's just had a rough stumble the last few games. Um, I like I like DK Metcalf's schedule the most rest of the season. Those Seattle wide receivers, they just have like a cookie cutter schedule. But the problem is Geno Smith has just not really been out there. So I kind of just kind of default to Zay Flowers. That's interesting. I, I think I might lean towards DK Metcalf. Joey, I know Dave, we talked about DK Metcalf maybe like 
Uh, he's a better. I, this I think this is gonna be a theme of the show. Better football player than fantasy player, right? But I think I, I do lean DK Metcalf just because of that that strength of schedule. According to Football Guys, it is the easiest remaining strength of schedule amongst wide receivers. I think it's the Rams, the Niners twice, the Eagles, the Titans, the Steelers. It's a pretty good one. Um, I, I think the other guy. It, so this is weird that we love CJ Stroud, but we're not willing to say that Nico Collins is going to do a whole lot better. Is is that the fear because of Tank Dell? So Nico Collins is the guy that I have that I think could really okay. outperform the ADP. I mean, right now he's a per game wide receiver 15. Like he already is doing it. Um, I think it's a lot like Cortland Sutton, though, where, you know, the target share hasn't been there. It, you know, if you look at the entire profile overall, there's a lot of reasons that you want to sell high on Nico Collins. You know, the target share hasn't been there. He's scored a lot of touchdowns. He's made a lot of big plays, but I would just rather invest in the Houston Texans offense than the Denver Broncos offense. CJ Stroud right now looks like a better quarterback than Cortland Sutton. So if one quarterback is going to be able to sustain a guy who has kind of had somewhat unsustainable production so far, I think Nico Collins can do it. I mean, he's drawn targets at a decent rate, but not even top 30 in the league, but he's drawn them deep downfield. He's making yards after the catch and he's scoring touchdowns. He just looks like a more dynamic receiver right now than a lot of the other guys that are in this cluster. Yeah, I think what worries me well, about Nico is Dalton Schultz as well. Like it's not just Tank Dell. Mm -hmm. You brought up Tank Dell, but Dalton Schultz is really involved in this offense, especially in the red zone. So yeah. yeah, it's a little bit of Dalton Schultz too. I like Nico a lot. And Noah Brown now as well. Yeah. This, <laughs> this Texans offense is just so much fun. <laughs> All right, guys, before we move along here, if you're enjoying this video so far, be sure to click the like button down below. Give it the old thumbs up. Make sure you drop your comments, your questions in the comments down below. So you have any questions about which wide receiver you might want to trade for, you're trying to go on a playoff run, win the championship in your league, we will be here to answer those questions. And make sure you're subscribed to the Football Guys channel because we have great content coming to you all week from the Football Guys Fantasy Football Show, the Dynasty Show, the DFS Show, the Audible. Been around for, Dave, I don't know what, at least 55 years. I think right? this is year no? 18 for him. I mean, uh, that was, that was the joke. Awesome. Sigmund Bloom said that the Audible is now old enough to vote. Yay. That's always fun. All right. Let's, uh, let's hop into tier number four here. I, I, I kind of dubbed this the wide receiver two tier. Like this is where we're, we're kind of saying, okay, all these guys are decent wide receiver twos that I'd, I'd be able to start on my team. So at 25 here, we've got Deontay Johnson of the Pittsburgh Steelers. He's been the wide receiver 17 since week seven. He's averaging more than eight targets per game. I think one of the issues here, though, is how sustainable will that be with Pittsburgh's very slow offense, with Kenny Pickett being just a yuck quarterback. And now we got Pat Fryermuth returning, guys. So uh, let's do this. Joey, on a scale of 1 to 10, how confident are you in Deontay Johnson going forward? As a wide receiver, too, I would say like a 7. Um, pretty confident. Okay. You're, you're lowest on him. Okay. Yeah, but still, even at that point, like this tier four, they're all kind of together in that tier together. There's a couple guys I like a little bit more than others. But listen, Deontay Johnson's getting used outside of a one reception, 17 yard performance last week in Screen Bay. He's been serviceable over 79 receiving yards in three out of the five games we've seen him. Um, you know, he missed week two through six, but he's averaging 2.4 PPR fantasy points per game. And for a borderline wide receiver, too, I'm, I'm okay with that. I feel pretty confident in that. Yeah, and I'm highest of the bunch on Deontay Johnson. I'm I'm pretty excited about him. I'd say if we're looking at, you know, is he going to be a wide receiver two confidence level there? I'd say a 10 or an 11. I mean, he's he's been very good as a wide receiver too. He's sixth in the league in targets per route run. But what's ex especially exciting is that he's drawing targets deeper downfield this year than he ever has, setting a career high in eight out. He has a career high in yards after the catch. And we saw that he finally broke the touchdown curse. He can, in fact, get into the end zone. So I liked uh, Deontay Johnson a ton. I mean, he does everything I want to see. He draws targets, draws him deep downfield, makes plays after the catch, and scores touchdowns now. Um, I've got him as my wide receiver 22, and that even feels a little bit too low. I think, uh, you know, like you said, the, the concerns are Pittsburgh and Kenny Pickett. I think what worries me is, like, the target volume all sounds great, but how much is a Kenny Pickett target? worth versus any other quarterback target it's like what is, is a buffalo nickel is that more than a regular nickel does anyone know <laughs> I, I don't so. know I haven't you guys are not currency since my, my grandpa said that way back well, when I, was I don't like know I, I just i just remember seeing those on tv all the time where like, you could buy it and i was like why is a nickel worth 20 bucks <laughs> anyways uh let's I will go say to deontay johnson is also a free agent after this year so deontay johnson is one of those guys that 
dynasty heads, you want to invest in Deontay Johnson because he shows the profile that he can be an elite wide receiver being hampered by the offense. Plug Deontay Johnson into a good offense and we could see immediate wide receiver one production. All right, let's go to number 24 here. We've got Debo Samuel. This has been interesting. So in games where Debo Samuel has received a target or did not leave with injury, which I know these are a lot of qualifiers here, he's averaging 17.1 PPR points per game. That would be the wide receiver 11 in points per game scoring. It's been a weird up and down season for him. Week four, he had the knee injury where he was basically a decoy. He went out there, zero targets on the game. Week six, leaves early with a shoulder injury. And Dave, as you so thoughtfully pointed out, on Twitter, when I said start Debo when he's healthy, you added the extra qualifier here is that he also needs to log a full practice, not just be active. Um, this is interesting. So you remain lowest on Debo. I have him at 22, Joey at 24, Dave, you're at 28. You do not see Debo Samuel as a top 25 wide receiver. It seems like a lot of that just still kind of hangs on injury stuff. Yeah, that, that's a lot of it. And it, and it's so funny that I'm the low guy on Debo Samuel now because I really kind of like made a name for myself in this industry in 2020 when I was telling everybody to draft Debo Samuel. And he finished the year as the wide receiver too, but those were crazy circumstances that are never going to happen again where we saw him in a goal line role for the second half of the season. We saw Brandon Ayuk in the doghouse for the first half of the season. The fact of the matter is now that Christian McCaffrey is there, that completely takes away the Debo role that was so cherished for year after year. Right now, the Debo role is being occupied by Christian McCaffrey. And on top of that, Debo Samuel isn't really being used as the primary wide receiver. Right now, he's 37th in the league in target share, where Brandon Ayuk is 11th. So he's the third option in this offense, behind CMC and behind Brandon Ayuk. And then you talked about the injury concerns as well. That's baked into my low ranking also. He's a great player when he's healthy. And if something happens to McCaffrey, if something happens to Ayuk, if something happens to Kittle, then we're looking at him as a top 12, top 15 guy. But when everybody's healthy and Debo is the one that typically isn't, he's kind of the odd man out in this offense. That's interesting to me because I don't think that all that stuff would preclude him from being in the top 25 um, because I think you should be able to make kind of the same arguments for a lot of these guys for uh, Ayuk, Debo, Kittle, in and out. We'll we'll talk more about the Niners wide receiver situation later because we're definitely going to be talking about Brandon Ayuk here. Uh, At number 23, we've got Christian Kirk, wide receiver for the Jacksonville Jaguars. He's been a top 27 wide receiver in seven of nine games. If you're not watching on YouTube, Dave has a shirt, but he also has Christian Kirk ranked lowest. So who's the fraud now? (laughs) Joey has him ranked highest at wide receiver 21. So Joey, I want to hear from you. Why do you love Christian Kirk? Why do we need to get on board? Maybe, you know, change our rankings up here a little bit. I don't profess my love with t-shirts. I profess it with just my heart. So I don't know where Dave's even at today with this Christian Kirk shirt. No, Uh, listen, there's a lot of Calvin Ridley wide receiver one predictions in Jacksonville this year. Christian Kirk kind of said, nah, that's me. I mean, he's proved that two years in a row now, he is the preferred option for Trevor Lawrence. Um, He's only had one single digit fantasy performance in the last eight games. Um, He's looked really great this season. He's dependable wide receiver too. And maybe I just like dependable receivers that I know are going to get me double digit fantasy points. As I looked at my notes, it kind of does show that like, if you give me double digit fantasy points, I'm pretty happy to throw you in my lineup. But if you're boomer bust and you give me a lot of Swiss cheese games, I don't really want those. Um, And he would honestly be higher for me. 20, what is it? 23 is kind of low for me but he's got a really tough rest of the season schedule. Um, I still think he's a preferred option there in Jacksonville, and I'm happy to have him on my fantasy lineups. So you've got him at 21, actually. He's 23 in our average our our consensus here between the three of us. So yeah, you've got him at 21, man. You're you're, you're pretty high on Christian Kirk, and you you stick to your guns, Joey. I'm going to. Anyone with their shirts tell you differently. I mean, he's been steady Eddie. We've seen that. Like he's got a very reliable floor outside of that week one showing, but he's still wide receiver 24 on the year. And he was the per game wide receiver 20 last year. That's kind of what we're looking at with Christian Kirk. I think it just becomes a preference of what type of receiver you like. Joey, you said you like the guys that are going to give you consistent production. I like the guys that are going to give you the peaks and valleys and give you those 35, 40 point weeks. You're not really going to get those as much from Christian Kirk. So I think he's a very fine plug and play wide receiver too. I'm just a little bit lower on him than you two because of the lack of a ceiling. But I mean, who expected him to be the wide receiver one over Calvin Ridley? Not many people, and that is certainly what he has become. 
And Dave, you say lower. You're you're 26. I'm 25. You and I are more in in sync here than than, than us with Joey. But I think all this tells us is that Christian Kirk kind of remains that low end wide receiver two on the fringe. You're you're probably starting him every single week uh, unless you know something drastic happens there. Uh, at, moving on here, at wide receiver 22, all here in the same tier. Marquise Brown, who oh, guys, he just barely missed out on a nice long touchdown uh. last week from Kyler Murray. Uh, I I know that we're you know very much on the Trey McBride hype train, but I don't think that we expect him to continue to lead the team with you know however many targets he did last week. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it was something ridiculous like ten or thirteen, 13 targets in the game. Yeah, it was it, it was, was a, nuts. It was a good matchup for McBride on paper, like mm-hmm. yeah, no, and it, it absolutely true. was. Yeah. And and I but I th- I think that better days are still ahead here for Marquise Brown, and I think that's what goes into our ranking here. Uh, I've got him at twenty three, Dave at twenty four, Joey at twenty five. He's got one of the best schedules remaining for wide receivers. He's got Houston, the Rams, Steelers, Niners, the Bears, Eagles. I mean, a lot of those are rough secondaries and offenses that you're going to see a shootout here with Kyler Murray. So, guys, I don't think there's much to say here on Marquise Brown. I don't know if anyone wants to add anything, but I, I think we all are kind of in agreement here. He's a good I'll player. Just add Things that, should get better. The last year when Kyler Murray was healthy and DeAndre Hopkins wasn't there, Marquise Brown over a six-game sample to start the season was the wide receiver five in scoring. So we didn't see it last week, but Kyler Murray back is going to elevate that offense, and Hollywood Brown has a sky-high ceiling for the rest of the season. I think we were all a little concerned to move him way, way up, but if you want to talk about one guy that's in this tier that could smash this rest of season ranking, it's Marquise Brown. He could easily find himself in the top six, top eight discussion for the rest of the season. Yeah, through his time in Arizona, like he's averaged three – PPR points more per game with Kyler Murray as the quarterback. So I know if you like what you saw to Marquise Brown to start the season, like you're really going to like how he finishes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, naturally, right. Wide receivers should do better when their starting quarterback is in. It's just, I don't think that we're seeing another wide receiver in the league, get this good of a caliber quarterback placed into their right. lineup. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, maybe the legend maybe of Josh Justin Dobbs. Jefferson. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, maybe <laughs> Justin Jefferson with the legend of Josh Dobbs. Uh, all right, let, let's go to wide receiver 21 here where we've got Adam Thiel. And this was the big talking point last time we did this, Dave, uh, where you and Victoria were a bit higher on Adam Thielen. He's sort of coming down now. We've seen weeks one through six, he was averaging nearly 21 points per game. He looked great. He was a wide receiver six in that time span since then. Averaging 11 points per game. He's the wide receiver 38 since week seven. So, Joey, you have him at wide receiver 22. I have him at 21. Dave, you are highest. You've got him at wide receiver 15. So, talk to us about Adam Thielen. Why, if you are a fantasy manager that has Adam Thielen, maybe you shouldn't be panicking. Maybe you should be holding on to him because, I mean, you still see him as a set it and forget it type player where I think Joey and I are getting a little bit more nervous. Well, you talk about week seven. Week seven is when Frank Reich gave up play calling duties, which he said that he is going to be taking back over here. So hopefully that could be the key. Has that been officially announced? I know it was discussed. I don't know if it's been officially announced yet. Has it? Not officially announced. Frank Reich said that he is thinking about taking play calling duties back, which I think is just step one to taking play calling duties back. And that was when we saw, um, you know, things change a little bit, but the volume has still been there. I mean, over those weeks, he is still seen nine targets per game. So the volume has been there. He's 12th in the league in targets per game. He's drawn just as many targets as CeeDee Lamb. He's drawing more targets than Chris Olave and Cooper Cup. He's getting elite usage, and I don't throw that term around lightly. He is truly seeing elite usage. I don't see why we can't look at him as anything other than a high-end wide receiver, too. I mean, he's basically getting Michael Pittman usage right now, and people are looking at him a tier or two below Michael Pittman. So let's just talk football here for a second, then. Because if the the big thing here was right, like Frank Reich is no longer the one that was calling the plays. It's been Thomas Brown, but Adam Thielen is still getting the usage. What changes with Frank Reich then? If because he's likely not going to get more targets than the same you know great target volume he's getting. What changes in terms of of football there then for Carolina? You know, I'd really have to dig into it. I'm looking right now. I have a gut feeling that his a dot changed and yeah that's exactly what it was we looked through the early weeks his a dots on a per game basis 6.6 9.9 6.1 6.6 9.2 and then you talk about that split in week seven or after his seventh game then his a dot dropped to 4.3 4.8 3.6 so adam thielen is still seeing the targets but he's not seeing the targets as deep downfield when frank reich was calling plays he was calling plays for adam thielen to get a little bit deeper where now he's playing on much shallower 
routes. So that's what I want to see. Obviously, drawing targets is great. Drawing targets deep downfield is better. And and that's interesting because you'd almost think that the shallower targets should be the easier layups, the ones that are getting completed, the ones that should be simpler. I'm I'm going to be very intrigued to see how that goes because when you initially said a dot, I thought you were going the other way. So to find out it was this this direction, uh, interesting. Joey, I saw you smiling, nodding along. How are you feeling about Adam Thielen? Because you traded him to me, and I thought that I was getting a good <laughs> trade here. So I want to hear how you feel about him. I just want to say you guys really nailed that analysis that you guys just ran through there. I really enjoy just being present in that whole exchange. Um, what worries me about Thielen is we saw the droppage in his production kind of come against the Bears and Colts, like not too elite uh, wide receiver defenses by any means. So I'm just wondering if there is a shift. And if Frank Wright's taking the play calling back, maybe that's a shift back to what we saw from before. Um, so I think my concern is Thielen kind of fell off at a time. I wasn't expecting it to happen. But like I like you said, I did trade him to you, so I was very happy that it did happen when it did because I benefited from it, and so you did mad. not. <laughs> I was so mad, man. I traded I traded Brian Robinson to you for Adam Thielen after everyone was telling me Adam Thielen, you know, he's, he's gonna be able to get you points, and I wasn't really in on him. I was like, all right, let's do it. And then of course you beat me this week with Brian Robinson. Thanks, bud. It's the best. Uh, it's let's the let's best. look at uh, wide receiver number twenty here, Puka Nakua. There's really not much to add. Uh, we all see him as a top 20 guy as long as Stafford is healthy. Mm -hmm. I think we can just move along here. There's not really anything to add. Uh, let, let's go to number 19 here where I'm sure there's going to be some very civil discussion that will have nothing to do with fantasy <laughs> football. It's probably just going to be personal <laughs> attacks aimed at each other. Let's talk about Chris Olave here. Uh, I've got him the highest. I'm at wide receiver 14. Dave, you're at wide receiver 20. Joey, uh, excuse me, Dave 21. Joey at 20. So before we get into this, as of right now, Chris Olave is wide receiver 15 on the season. He's wide receiver 21, however, in points per game amongst wide receivers with eight games played. It's definitely been from from what I'm looking at here. I'm trying to do the B rabbit thing. I'm going to get out in front and say all the bad things about him so that you can't, Dave. This the is only my bad thing is now. just Derek Carr. I mean, you can yeah, just sum it up as it, simply it is, as it possible. Is. Derek Carr sucks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is. It is. But like, I want to I want to give it even more context. Like, so we saw weeks two through five. 10.9 points per game, then week six through 10 up to 15.4 points per game. Like there was a big jump and that, that jump still happened with Derek Carr. I think Derek Carr stopped being so bad. Like we saw him even for his fantasy performances hasn't been as bad. In my opinion, I think we kind of saw a worst case scenario in those first few weeks, weeks two through five, healthy Michael Thomas, Rashid Shahid catching touchdowns and Derek Carr playing like absolute booty. And now we got Michael Thomas, with a fairly a quote, fairly significant knee injury from head coach Dennis Allen. And I think the, the next thing, Dave, and like, you're right. You, you're, you're absolutely right here where I don't think we can ignore how the splits changed with Jameis Winston going in versus Derek Carr. It's super small. It's very small sample size. What I can't get over and maybe my small fantasy football brain can't get over this is how a player averaging more than nine targets per game finishes outside the top 20. Last year, the five receivers that did it finished as top five receivers. We've seen it happen before where these guys that, that averaged nine targets per game didn't have amazing finishes. It happened to Marquise Brown two years ago. It happened to DJ Moore two years ago, and they were you know top 20 wide receivers. But I, I'm i flabbergasted. I'm flummoxed. Give me some other fun words here now on Chris me, Olave. Let me ask you what those, those guys had in common real quickly, Alfredo. DJ Moore in Carolina and Marquise Brown in Baltimore. They were drawing nine plus targets per game, and they were drawing those targets deep downfield deep. with low catchable target rates. Right now, Chris Olave, his A dot 13.1 is 16th highest in the league. He's drawing targets deep downfield. His catchable target rate, 65.9%, is 76th in the league. So it's the same story. He's drawing the targets. He's drawing the targets deep downfield. He just can't get on the same page with his quarterback. If you mm -hmm. told me Jameis Winston was going to start every single game for the rest of the season, Chris Olave would be Different. inside my top 10. The issue I have with Chris Olave has nothing to do with Chris Olave, nothing to do with his talent, nothing to do with the play calling. It is just that Derek Carr and him cannot get on the same page on deep balls. Love Chris Olave. He's a guy long term. I am looking to buy into Chris Olave, but I said it in the preseason. I think Chris Olave's outlook would be better if they stuck with Andy Dalton. I think bringing Derek Carr in was a downgrade to Chris Olave's outlook, and we're seeing it this year. So I, I want to do the football conversation again here, and I'd love to hear both your opinions on this, and we'll move we'll move along. 
if Michael Thomas has a significant knee injury and he's placed on IR, do you guys think it's possible we see some more of those shorter and intermediate routes here for Michael Thomas taking over a little bit more of that role? Because that's not the Rashid Shahid role either. Rashid Shahid no, is, is really the field stretcher on that team. So, so I Jamar almost Johnson wonder. Role. Yeah, I, I, I start to wonder, like, what? What changes here with this offense? Are they forced to use Chris Olave in more efficient ways, smarter ways, instead of just throwing him downfield constantly? I hope so. Just, but what we saw earlier when uh, Juwan Johnson didn't play is that's when Taysom Hill started running routes and running a ton of routes. So I almost wonder if now that's just what they can kind of use Taysom Hill for. He's just the Band-Aid for whoever's not playing. When Jamal Williams was out, Taysom Hill was running a ton. When Juwan Johnson was out, Taysom Hill was running a ton of routes. And now with Michael Thomas out, we might see Taysom Hill lining up in the slot and running these crossers, crossers that Michael Thomas is crossers. making a living off of. Joey, go ahead. I, I want to hear your take on this. Situation Honestly, well. I was about to make the joke more Taysom Hill trick plays, but are they really tricks anymore? Because it's kind of what we're getting outside of last week where he was the trick. Yeah, they're illusions. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> off the rails. No, I mean, I I think we will see Olave get a little bit more work, but I, in my notes, it does say if Jameis Winston were given the starting quarterback job this week, I would have Olave top 15. I, I'm not bold on 10, but I, it's all about Derek Carr. It truly is. I just can't get away from that. All right, let's move along here at wide receiver 18. We've got Devonte Smith. All three of us see him as a top 20 guy rest of season. He's just too talented. That offense is too good. I don't think there's really anything to add there. Uh, AJ Brown has definitely been the target hog for that team, yeah. but uh, we've got injuries to Dallas Goddard now and a really good schedule for the Eagles going forward. So we could see a lot of shootouts there. Devonte Smith, don't sleep on him, guys. He's still a top 20 fantasy wide receiver. Very good NFL receiver. 23 uh, points, another guy, 14 points in his last two weeks before the bye, I want to say, too. So yep, he is starting yep. to produce again. We talked about him as a buy low player. And if you bought low, you're feeling pretty good after those last two games. And that's exactly what he yeah. did last year. He came on strong in the yep. second half of the season. So, And now with Dallas so Goddard that's, out, that's what that's, you do. that was the common denominator. Dallas Goddard got hurt, and then Devontae Smith exploded. Dallas Goddard is hurt now, and we're going to see a lot more of Devonta Smith. So that's it. Next year, just don't draft Devontae Smith. Draft other people and then trade for Devontae Smith in like week seven. Exactly. And you're good. Yeah. That's it. Yep. Yeah. Fantasy football <laughs> analysis. All right. Number 17 here. We're looking at Garrett Wilson, wide receiver for the New York Jets. And guys, I got to say, I've been so impressed. Uh, I think that I, I really thought once Zach Wilson took over, that was it. The New York yeah. Jets offense was dead. And I think everyone thought that. I'm not alone on that. I'm not being some sort of Jets hater. I think everybody thought the Jets and Jets off is kind of dead. Like they still don't score points. However, Garrett Wilson from a fantasy perspective, this is nuts. And it's crazy. I'm actually highest on Garrett Wilson. Uh, taking a look at it right now. I'm I'm 17. Dave, you're 19. Joey, you're 18. This is growth for me to put Garrett Wilson highest amongst the three of us. I'm really <laughs> proud of myself. I've done. I'm, I'm doing good. I'm doing really good. Uh, since week four, Garrett Wilson is the wide receiver 13 in points per game. And we talk about Chris Olave's targets. Garrett Wilson is averaging 12 targets per game since that time, since week four. He leads everyone in the NFL by at least two targets. He has two more targets per game than the second highest target per game leader in the NFL right now. This is absolutely insane. The volume for Garrett Wilson is there. The efficiency isn't fantastic. The Zach Wilson kind of sucks, but Garrett Wilson has been so good that he's been able to make plays. Joey, I saw a lot of nodding, a lot of, mm hmm. How are you feeling about Garrett Wilson? Kind of like your argument. We can kind of go back to the Chris Olave. Like he's getting this must usage. How can he not finish as a top 15 wide receiver? Um, and I think if he had a little bit better of a quarterback, he would easily be maybe in our top, what, seven, eight? Wide receivers can come into yeah. the season. He kind of was when we had Aaron Rodgers. So I don't Aaron think Aaron Rodgers with a boot and crutches would make Chris uh, Garrett Wilson a top ten wide receiver. <laughs> like anything. Can, can we just Wilson. say? Can we just say that the Jets should have got Josh Dobbs? How uh, do you not do uh, that? If you're there, if you're there waiting and hoping Aaron Rodgers comes back, how do you not make a move for Josh Dobbs? What did Aaron Rodgers spill on the side of the field? I could not figure out what that thing was. Tequila. Oh my gosh, I don't know. It was a beaker. It was it was, it was a beaker of something. Yeah, Somebody he said, uh, I, I forget it. who, he said that every time he meets up with some guy at Jets games, he gives him a fresh bottle of tequila, and he said that's what it is. But, you know, we talk sure. about Chris Olave. He's drawing his targets deep downfield, and they're uncatchable. 
Garrett Wilson is drawing his targets 11.1 yards downfield, which is 44th highest in the league, so not significantly deep whatsoever, and still has a lower catchable target rate than Chris Olave. 64.2% of Garrett Wilson's catches or, or uh, targets are catchable, and he is still making plays. We kind of joked around after that first Zach Wilson game. We said, if Garrett Wilson can make a superhuman catch every single week and defy the odds and score a touchdown, yeah, he's going to be fantasy relevant. And that's exactly what he's done week after week. He takes these terribly thrown balls and turns nothing into something. So I think Garrett Wilson is just a prime example of just betting on the talent because he is so, so good. Yeah, just because the Jets are a circus doesn't mean that he needs to make circus catches by any means. (laughs) I I want to take a moment here and just recognize Ohio State with Garrett Wilson, Chris Olave. CJ Stroud, Jackson Smith, the Jigba, Marvin, Marvin Harrison, Harrison Jr. Jr. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. They're so good. Looks like LSU so back good. in the day. Oh, all right. Wide receiver 16 here. We got Amari Cooper of the Cleveland Browns. Not much to go on here. We all have him as a top 20 guy rest of the season. Very minimal change in the rankings here for us. Let's make the jump now. We're going to go into tier number three, where we're getting into the top 15 wide receivers. And at number 15, we've got Michael Pittman Jr. This one's been interesting. I believe, yes, I was highest on Michael Pittman Jr. at 13. Joey, you're at 14. Dave at 17. Michael Pittman, man, he's averaging nearly 11 targets per game with Gardner Minshew at quarterback. Uh, Another guy where the volume is just there. But I mean, the production's there too. It's not like... it's not like the targets are, are being sprayed all over the place and he's missing them. Since week six with Gardner Minshew taking over... Michael Pittman is wide receiver nine in points per game. He's a wide receiver seven overall. How is this happening? And it just, it feels like it's really being swept under the rug. Like we're just not noticing this. Is this just Dave, you're lowest on him. So is this just kind of a thing where you're saying Gardner Minshew is going to turn into a pumpkin with really cool hair soon? I don't think that. I think Michael Pittman's a really good player. Um, I've long been a Michael Pittman fan. You know, after his disappointing rookie season, I was screaming from the mountaintops that he was a buy low. And I have Michael Pittman on just about every one of my dynasty rosters. Been really happy with the production so far. Uh, But we haven't really seen the ceiling. You know, elite usage, lack of ceiling. Like I said, it's very similar to Adam Thielen. You start looking at the A dot, the route participation, the target share, the targets per route run yards after the catch you kind of add it all together and Michael Pittman is pretty much doing the same exact thing Adam Thielen does so I'm not knocking Michael Pittman by any means for me it just comes down to preferring the ceiling of some other guys Devonta Smith DJ Moore Jalen Waddle Brandon Ayuk I like Michael Pittman a lot I think he is a high-end wide receiver to rest of season I just prefer some of the guys that I think can really vault themselves into top five top eight roles down the stretch where I don't know if Michael Pittman is going to be able to maintain that pace. Yeah, and let's put some context to that, Dave. You've got Amari Cooper, Adam Thielen, Jalen Waddle, Brandon Ayuk, DJ Moore, Devontae Adams, all ahead of Michael Pittman Jr. So true to your word. I think word. we uh I don't think any of us should have Devontae Adams. We'll we'll save that conversation. Devontae Adams, though, I don't know if any of us should have Devontae Adams ahead of Michael Pittman. We're just grasping onto some priors but uh that'll that'll be a fun Devontae adams conversation (laughs) yeah it'll be interesting i'm very curious let's um once again let's have a very civil discussion here wide receiver 14 taking a look at dj Moore. joey you have him at 15 i have him at 16 dave you have him as wide receiver 12 so i i would like to hear what your thoughts are with dj Moore. uh bears fandom aside I just want to hear the objective analysis that I know that Dave Kluge is going to give. I know you like these guys that you don't mind if they're volatile. You like the guys that can boom. DJ Moore absolutely has that skill set. So talk to us about DJ Moore. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's super simple. I just wrote about DJ Moore in my three up, three down article yesterday. Said that he is a buy low. I mean, it really comes down to he's scoring twice as many points per game with Justin Fields than he has been with Tyson Bajan. 20 points per game with Fields under center through six weeks. In the four games, undrafted, Tyson Bajan has started 9.8 points per game. That's it. I mean, he was a top 10 wide receiver when Fields was on the field. He has been the wide receiver 47 with Tyson Bajan. It's really all it comes down to. Uh, he and Fields have good chemistry. Um, we know that there's going to be some volatility there. We saw the week one game where he did almost nothing. We saw the game against Washington where he exploded for 200 plus yards and three touchdowns. But 
like we talked about earlier when talking about some other players, I like those volatile guys, the guys that can absolutely win you your week. And DJ Moore has that in his range of outcomes every single week that Justin Fields is starting. Joey, I want to pose this question to you because I think we're kind of seeing a theme here where there are, I want to pose, there are a lot of really talented receivers. And I do feel like receiver is the position most where you get that disconnect between he is a really good player versus he is a very good fantasy producer. And DJ Moore always feels like that guy who's been really good, but has not quite been able to reach the mountaintop. And Dave, I want to dissect even further here. Um, and we will in a moment, but Joey, I just want to hear, you know, how, how do you embrace the volatility with a guy like DJ Moore? Because it hasn't been something where it's just Justin Fields in Justin Fields out. It's been week one through three wide receiver 40 week four through five wide receiver one week six through 10 wide receiver 33. It's, it's a heck of a peak and Valley here. Even I feel like some Justin pretty Fields. arbitrary splits there, Alfredo. I just want to say, I feel like you're just kind of drawing lines. No, you feel like how is it arbitrary? Take, take how is it arbitrary bo- to say that? Game, how, taking a game what's... where Justin Fields no, played half a game. Come on, feels come pretty on, arbitrary man. to me. What's arbitrary? Looking at DJ Moore have two massive blow up games and then the rest of the game's not good. Come on, that's not arbitrary. You say not good, but he he, he, he had more he had more games all... with Justin Fields where he wasn't in the top top twenty four than than he did with Fields. I I don't think it's fair to just simply say with Fields he's great. With Fields he had two great games. I'm I'm like I'm, I mean he had a double digit I, I floor in crazy. all but week one with Fields. He right, eleven in. eleven points per game made him the wide receiver forty in those first three weeks. Yeah. So we okay, let's, let's put you and me aside. Let's put you in a bit of a floor. <laughs> Sure, I'm not saying he doesn't have a floor. I'm just saying he's not, to, to me, he's not a top 12 wide receiver. So let's put you and me aside. I want to ask Joey here where he is on this because it's different to see embracing the variance, right? Like you're very much into embracing the volatility on a player like DJ Moore. So Joey, talk to me about that. How do you embrace the volatility with a player like DJ Moore? So normally, I, I've said earlier, I don't like the wide receivers that are volatile. Not as much. But with DJ Moore, he's on pace to beat all his career numbers. Uh, what receiving yardage and touchdowns he's on pace to beat both of those this season and i'm seeing that from fields he's looked better than he's ever looked before so i don't see him as that volatile yeah there's big there's big swings and there's been a few bad misses um i'm just a little more trusting a dj more rest of season than i have been in previous years so the thing with dj Moore here the schedule coming up it's gonna be interesting I have a tough time putting him in my top 12. I, it's not like I hate him. I have him as my wide receiver 16. So like there's not hatred here, but he's got Detroit twice, Cleveland, and then a bye week. And I think that more than ever, we do have to consider those bye weeks when you need every single win with a star player. So four to the next five weeks are a little tough here for him. Uh, l- let's get to another guy where there's, uh, once again, a little bit of dissension here on the rankings. Brandon Ayuk. Okay, we've got him as the wide receiver 13 in consensus. Um, excuse me. No, we have him as the wide receiver. Yeah. Wide receiver 13. 13. Sorry. I didn't Mm -hmm. want to mess that up. Uh, yeah. Wide receiver 13. Uh, I've got him at number 15. Dave, you're at 13. Joey, you are highest at wide receiver 11. So we're not that far apart where I struggle with Brandon. Ayuk is in terms of he's been a top 20 wide receiver twice this year. One of those games came without Debo Samuel. And I think to me, Ayuk is one of those guys where he is the perfect example of incredibly talented player, but it doesn't always turn into fantasy points. So uh, I'm not saying you're wrong, but this is a strong stance to have him as a top 11 guy. So I want to hear, maybe there's something that I'm not seeing or that maybe the audience needs to see. Why do you have Brandon Ayuk as a top 11 wide receiver going forward? Yeah, this 49ers offense, it kind of reminds me last year of the Seahawks, just inefficiency. The 49ers right now are statistically dead last in passing attempts. They are throwing the ball the least amount of times in the NFL right now. But they're the 11th best team in receiving yardage. So they are just being super efficient. Brandon Ayuk's a huge part of that. Of wide receivers with 35 receptions or more, he's leading the league in yards per reception to 17.8 yards per receptions. He's just having an excellent season. He's crushing his career average with 18, 84.4 yards per game. He's just having a great year. I think he's a wide receiver one in this team. They get the ball in his hands. He's being electric this year. Uh, I'm just in on Brandon Ayuk on a team that is going to most likely head very deep into the playoffs. 
You don't have to say think he's the wide receiver one, Joey. Just, yeah, okay. just say it with your chest. He is very clearly yeah, the wide receiver one. He's 11th in the league in target share. Debo Samuel is 37th in the league in target share. And again, we talk about quality of targets. Brock Purdy's been putting them on the money. And Brandon Ayuk has the eighth highest A dot in the league, average depth of target. So not only is he 11th in target share, but he's eighth in target depth. He's drawn a ton of targets, drawing them deep downfield, making plays after the catch. Kyle Shanahan just schemes plays up where you see Brandon Ayuk like he isn't even covered. Like there is no guy within 10 yards of Brandon Ayuk. He is on an island and Purdy could just float it out there for him. I understand the concerns about a lot of mouths to feed in San Francisco. But again, we want to talk about embracing the volatility here with some of these guys. Brandon Ayuk is a guy that can go for three touchdowns and 200 yards on any given week. He's just such a talented player on a good offense. I, I, I have... No qualms with Joey putting him as high as 11. Uh, I've got him at 13, but I mean, he he can absolutely give you a, you know, the wide receiver one of any given week because of his talent. Now, we're going to finish up here with three more wide receivers at number 12, Jalen Waddle at number 11, Devontae Adams and at number 10, Mike Evans. And Dave, you kind of alluded to the fact that we need to talk about Devontae Adams because Devontae Adams, it's been, it's very up and down. I still think I lean towards Devontae Adams as a very good player. And Antonio Pierce wants to use his best players. And we saw him kind of make it a point to target Devontae Adams. But you have your fears still. I, I want to hear why you think that not only should Devontae Adams maybe not be a top 11 wide receiver, but maybe we should be ranking him behind guys like Michael Pittman and maybe have him outside the top 15. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, you know, I talked about Devontae Adams also in yesterday's three up, three down article and talk about Devontae Adams as somebody who is trending down. I mean, right now he's the wide receiver 21 in scoring, and that is with a game where he had 20 targets, 172 yards, two touchdowns and 42.2 fantasy points. I mean, that one game was great. And outside of that, there really hasn't been anything exciting with Devontae Adams. Uh, I don't know, that seems kind of arbitrary. I really I mean, wanted to bring that back. Sure, I'm sorry. It is. But I mean, it's it's been one game where he was peppered with 20 targets. Outside of that, he's got one score on 96 targets through the rest of the season. Yeah. And now what we're seeing with Antonio Pierce is a team that wants to run the ball more. We're seeing them get the ball into Josh Jacobs hands much more frequently. My biggest concern, though, is, yeah, over the last two weeks, we have seen the target volume there for Devontae Adams. He's seen 20 targets but he's just turned that into 120 scoreless yards. My fear is that Aiden O'Connell just isn't that good. I mean, yeah. he's fun. He likes to sling the ball all over the field, but I don't know if he's going to be able to support Devontae Adams. We hear all the time that rookie quarterbacks cannot support top 12 fantasy wide receivers. Well, what about when it's a fantasy wide receiver who is also splitting targets with Jacoby Myers on a run first team? This really doesn't have anything to do with Devontae Adams. I think talent-wise, he's still one of the best guys in the league. My concerns here are 100% tied to Aiden O'Connell. Even with that boom game, Devontae Adams has still been outside of the top 20 in fantasy scoring. He is basically unstartable at this point. I mean, it's really, really tough considering you drafted him at the 1-2 turn, but he just has been pretty, pretty rough this year. Yeah, and in the three games with Aiden O'Connell, Devontae Adams is averaging 12 and a half PPR points, which it's not awful, but it's definitely not a guy that you are plugging in as a wide receiver one and expecting that kind of production every single week. I will say the target volume is still there. Uh, 13 targets in week four against the Chargers, and then 13 targets again in week 10 against the Jets. We could be looking at another shootout for the next two weeks against Miami and Kansas city. And then after the bye week they got Minnesota and then the chargers and then Kansas city again. So I, I think if there's a saving grace here for Devonte Adams and Joe, I want to hear your thoughts on it as well. Uh, I think if there's a saving grace, it's going to be that a little bit of that game script is going to require the Raiders to throw the ball a little bit more. Joey, where are you at with uh, Devonte Adams? Absolutely. I think it's funny earlier we were poo pooing on Derek Carr, but boy, we'd all wish he'd be there now. Don't we? Don't we wish he'd be there in, <laughs> in Las Vegas? But yeah, with O'Connell yeah. and even Jimmy G, like it, it's just been tough this year for Devontae Adams. Um, volume's still good. Um, if these passers don't improve though for the Raiders, like I have him as like a borderline wide receiver, wide, re wide receiver one, wide receiver two, but he might just be that down towards that wide receiver two. It truly is. And it makes me sad because I think he's ranked so high because we know what he can be. It just, it doesn't look like it's going to happen. 
And I just want to point out real quickly, because I, I think you make a good point. Like Derek Carr and Devontae Adams were electric last year. They had such a great connection, but they were playing such different roles. I mean, Chris Olave right now, he's drawn his targets almost four yards deeper downfield than Devontae Adams was last year, where Chris Olave is playing primarily outside of the numbers. Josh McDaniels was scheming Devontae Adams up to run those crossers across the middle of the field where Derek Carr is most comfortable. So Devontae Adams was running shorter routes across the middle of the field, which is where we see targets going to right now with Derek Carr, where he's hitting Michael Thomas and he's hitting Juwan Johnson and he's hitting Taysom Hill across the middle. Derek Carr doesn't like throwing to the outside nearly as much and that's why we're seeing Chris Olave struggle right now even though Devontae Adams was able to put up elite numbers with Derek Carr last year all right well we're gonna jump into the next tier tier two where we've got our top nine wide receivers we're gonna ask these questions the important questions is Jamar Chase still actually a top three fantasy wide receiver can you trust a guy like Cooper Cup and how bad could it actually get for Stefan Diggs and the Bills <sighs> Not great right now, but we're going to continue this conversation over on the audio version of this show. So you can join us by clicking the link to your favorite podcast platform down in the description below or over on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and you can go and finish the rest of the show over there. We'll catch you on the other side. Adios. 